Nothing is true. Nothing is true. Everything is true. Everything is permitted. Actually, you know, you could you could say uh, you could begin by talking about uh, Native American political theory, right. uh, which uh, certainly began to have an influence on uh, the more radical colonists. Immediately, they arrived and found out the way Indians lived, uh, and f for the in I would say for the entire history of American anarchism, right up to the 1960s and the present. It's been a rediscovery of, of Native American political theory over and over and over again, which is mm -hmm. frequently prompted, like the tribalist movement in the 60s, which was very mm -hmm. non-authoritarian and could, could be called anarchistic. And similarly, right from the start in the 15th and early 16th centuries, um, colonists immediately discovered that um, Native Americans had a, more, uh, a less oppressive, a more attractive political theory and social existence than they had left behind, especially if they happened to be lower class in, uh, in Europe. So uh, dropoutism and Indianism were among two of the first important um, influences on, uh, <coughs> on what later became the uh, American anarchist tradition. So you don't have to start as we did last time. As I said, we started last time with radical Protestantism just for some place to start. But you can always push it farther back again. You know? Okay, I uh, I know we've been treated to less and less of uh, we, we've w as someone who was educated in the American uh, school system. Uh, basically, what you learned about Indians was what you learned in the in the um, uh, Western uh, cowboy films. Uh, the uh, the the, uh, the uh, only Cir the circle of uh, of caravan of uh, covered of wagons, wagons and right. but I, I uh, let's not I uh, first of all there were a thousand tribes and they all had uh, a sure, lot of they, variants absolutely and, and, and no, obviously and, and the, and the eastern, eastern tribes were the big influence and especially the Algonquin Confederacy and uh, a lot of historians think I'm no expert but I've heard it said frequently that the Articles of Confederation which was the organizing document that came after the Declaration yeah. of Independence and was indeed a very radical democratic document, was in large part based on Algonquin political theory. Well, I'm glad you didn't say the Constitution because... No, uh, no, the Constitution is a Freemasonic plot. We all okay, know that. Okay, we all know that. Uh, so we don't want to romanticize counter -revolution. the Indians. And, and from just from a... Uh, I've been reading a little of the about the Indian... Uh, Indian colonist wars, and uh, there was enough uh, guilt and horror on both sides to go around. Sure, but that is. So, if way. I had to pick, uh, you know, if I had to pick, I, uh, you know, which you don't, uh, I don't think the Indians have given enough credit. But I just want, don't want them to be uh, overly romanticized. No, 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 no. We don't want to go uh, dancing with wolves here. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, there. After all, it is romantic. I mean, the whole, the whole idea, there is, there is some, I like to say romanticism might not be truth, but at least it's not banal, boring, stupid simulation. Uh, romantic, there is some, there is a core of something real in romanticism, and that is what we desire. Uh, it, the, okay. Right? And, uh, we just want the good romanticism. Yeah, we want, that's right, we want a realistic romanticism, if that's possible. But um, what drew, um, Many, many white people to drop out and literally become Indians, you know. Like Morton. Like, like Morton was, uh, he didn't actually go that far. Uh, there were people who just plain disappeared, like the Roanoke colony, the lost colony, really? the first really, first uh, permanent established American colony dropped out and became Indians. And they're st actually, they're still living there on the North Carolina the, uh, border. I mean, this is. Uh they didn't so you just. Mean they weren't murdered by Indians. Like no, yeah. exactly. That was right. the point I was going to make. That in okay. my school book, I remember reading that they were wiped out right. by, by naughty Indians. Such was not the case. They left a perfectly clear message carved on a tree, gone to Croatan. It was the uh, the message that the that they had expected to find, that White had expected, John White expected to find when he got back, but for various reasons, they never went and looked for them there until four or five years later. And by that time, they had gone somewhere else. 
So what year was this and how many people were involved? Well, they started and this was like 15, in the 15, 15, wow. 1590s. No, that was uh, Jamestown. That was the first successful one, the one that didn't uh, disappear. It was eight. It was actually in the 1580s and 90s, somewhere, right. somewhere around in there. And how many of them were there? Were they, they all were, men? No, they were not. There was Virginia Dare, you know, the uh -huh. first uh, white person born in America, mm. who was John White's granddaughter. And uh, there were a number of women. I mean, what probably happened is, is uh, as far as the best guess now, is that um, there was some trouble with, um, who was it, Powhatan, I think, one of the mm -hmm. big chiefs, and that uh, they went to live with a, a friendly tribe, the Croatans, and moved south and out away from the, uh, from the trouble that they'd been having with Powhatan. And uh, by, the, by the time the um, Raleigh's uh, people got back to look for them, they were well gone. And this was a settlement that was sort of, uh, was supposed to be a permanent settlement? Yes, it was supposed to be, right. right. It was supposed and to be an agricultural was, uh, settlement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was Raising too small. They didn't. It was too small. It was only like a hundred or so people. I and see. then when the supplies didn't come the next year, they were in trouble. Mm -hmm. But clearly, they also wanted to drop out and become Indians because even when they could have gone back uh, in the six, early 1600s, they didn't. And we have reports. There are reports of these people. You know, vague reports about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Where could people. one read about that? Oh, there's a lot of books on the Roanoke. I have one now. I can't remember the author's name. It's just called Roanoke. Okay. Uh, Look, the the Roanoke story of the America's keyword. first colony. Okay. Uh, uh, Croatan an offshore island? Uh, Croatan, near yeah. It was another island offshore. It was also the name of a, of a small tribe of Indians. And uh, there's a group now in um, northern North Carolina uh, <coughs> who, had their, who, who are officially called now the Croatan Indians. Uh, and have um, some of them have the uh, same last names. So this was as a the uh, as the Roanoke colonists. So uh, they have the best claim. There are other groups that claim descent too. So this was a commercial, sort of a commercial, not a religious-based colony. Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, there are those who would say that uh, that even the the Virginia colonies had their religious uh, purpose. There was, uh, you know, the, perhaps the Church of England, but I mean, it was certainly the Church of England was very involved in the Virginia colonies. But there's an even more interesting story that Raleigh and John Dee and um, Harriet, James Harriet, and uh, uh, Walsingham, and some of the uh, uh, Hack Lloyd, the map maker, and a lot of these people who were involved in early colonization were some kind of proto-Freemasons, you know, some I kind see. of Rosicrucian occultist I thing see. going on there, certainly with John Dee. So is that established in your... No, that's a theory of mine. Okay. Well, let's... Uh, we've got to cover a lot oh, yeah, of ground we gotta, here. we got to get on with that. Let's go into... There. Yeah, let's go into New England All now. right, so... And uh, those were religious... Uh, you remember last... You, you all remember last week we discussed the... Church, Church of England problems. And the radical Protestant sects. And, and, and then they came to uh, New Many England. Many of them came to New England. This is something else that gets lost from our history books, which talk about pilgrims and Puritan fathers. They leave out uh, the fact that a lot of these far more radical sects also got shipped over to, uh, to the New World. Or, or deported, or came on their what own. Was, what was some oh, of so there, I mentioned ranters, diggers, uh, the family they of They came love. here? Yeah, well, at least they were certainly accused of coming here. Right. The Puritans wrote tracts against them. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that they had met such people. Uh, Did they identify them by name? Well, you know, all right, so it's problematical. They called mm -hmm. Anne Hutchinson, for example. They said Anne Hutchinson was a member of the Family of Love, uh, which I don't think was literally true. Family so what were her dates? Oh, you, about dates. I mean, was she was she was she part of the uh, part of the uh, original uh, Puritan settlement in the 1630s? Yeah, pretty pretty original. I mean, not the very first, but uh, she was basically what she was. She started out as a Puritan who took the whole thing seriously and got into the inner light experience, and then began to think, bold woman that she was, that she knew better than the ministers. So uh, mm. that she had had this mystical experience, and that this gave her the right to preach and that, in fact, most of the other ministers there did not have the right to preach because they had not gotten in touch with their own inner light. So this is what caused her to be 
And was you know, it tried, uh, condemned? And, were there and, women uh, preachers at that time, or no. was she breaking ground? She was too? certainly breaking a custom, if not law. She got uh, exiled to Rhode Island, where to Roger Williams. Yeah, Roger Williams had gone the year before. Had been forced uh, there. Had been forced out the year before. She started her own little colony, which then later finally moved to Pelham Bay. And, uh, In New where, York, yeah, New York City. Right. So where she was unfortunately killed by some Indians who mistook her for, for the Dutch that they were fighting with. Because she was, like all these people, she was very pro-Indian. All of these radicals were pro-Indian. You can always tell, you know, you could, that's the dividing line. You got Cotton Mather and the Puritan Fathers on one hand who were anti-woman, anti, you know, everything, mm -hmm. including especially anti-Indian. And they saw them as a primeval, uh, sexual, and uh, Yeah, the far, the, evil. You know, the, the howling wilderness. The uh, devil. Yeah, absolutely, the devil and the howling wilderness. Pay, uh, heathens was the right. favorite term. So you had, you had the exceptional cases, people like, like Morton of Marymount and Ann Hutchison who were pro-Indian. and. Anne didn't write anything, as far as I know, uh, after her expulsion from Massachusetts. But according to reports, she had gone, as we would say, to the left and was now preaching against all government. And uh, all right. so, <laughs> in a sense, I, I would like to nominate Anne Hutchison uh, as the first American anarchist. But then there were immediately many others who would perhaps come at around the same time and enjoy that title, including a guy named William Harris that I was telling mm -hmm. you about, who was an enemy of Roger Williams, who thought that Roger Williams was a right-wing uh, reactionary. I mean, he was so far to the left of Williams. And uh, he definitely talked about no masters, no slaves, no magistracy, which was the 17th century word for government. Uh, he came out of a religious thing. Uh, the Seekers was the sect that Roger Williams belonged to. Uh, but uh, he seems to have taken the whole thing a step further into a, a political anarchism to, uh, and to get perfectionism, you know, the idea that you could perfect the human being in this lifetime and that paradise would be here and now. To get back to the Puritans, and uh, who later became the Congregationalists, and who founded, who founded uh, Yale and Harvard to mostly to make ministers, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you consider them, uh, uh, in any sense, uh, witch hunters that some of them uh, started out as, uh, as ancestors of American liberalism? Yeah, I mean, the, the strange thing that happens is that in England, the Puritans are a kind, of, kind of on the left, if we can use these modern terms, mm -hmm. which I'm reluctant to do, but it's the easiest way to talk about it. So the Puritans are on the left. They move to America, suddenly they're the establishment, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're in control. So what happens, all the uh, potential reactionary aspects of, of, of Protestantism there, thereupon emerge immediately. I mean, the, uh, the pilgrims had like one year of communist experience and they gave it up you know, after a year and became, uh, you know, became... Uh, um, as who we, was, as there? We, was there, was there Yeltsin? Pardon? <laughs> Did they have the Yeltsin? I don't get that. I mean, uh, they did the same thing that the uh, that the Russians are now doing. They privatized. Ah, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. First oh, yes, Yeltsin, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course, right. Um, so, uh, Morton was an interesting figure in this in this respect. He was Church of England. So when he was in England, you could say he was part of the establishment. But when he came over to the New World, he found these Puritans in control. And he was a man who liked to drink and have a good time, you know, and uh, he got along fine with the Indians. He thought they were much nicer and more interesting people than the Puritans, you know. And uh, so he, he set up the famous Maypole and uh, at Marymount. had the first, as I like to say, interracial be-in in America and at Marymount and uh, then was busted, busted by the, by the pilgrims, by the famous Miles Standish came to and actually arrested them in the midst of their revels. So he had been turned by the New World into what? A dissident, uh, someone who would, we would say was perhaps on the left, you know, mm -hmm. was, uh, as by comparison with the uh, Puritans and pilgrims on the right. So the New World had this mirroring effect, you know, it would turn things into their opposites to some extent. And uh, um, it was a process of, uh, for a lot of people, of of becoming wild, you know, of becoming that wild man that was the image in Shakespeare, Caliban, you know, 
the, uh, the what uh, Rousseau later called the noble savage. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the unleashing of uh, basic uh, human yeah. passions. Unleashing of passions. That's right. The uh, passion as a, a force for cohesive social cohesion. Yeah, because there were disorder. no the structures were in here that existed in Europe. Yeah. So basically, basically, I, my my feeling is that every early settlement in America was a, a utopian settlement in some respect. Uh, in some cases, as soon as they became established, they would give up those utopian ideals. Yeah. Well, they came here to establish a kind of much better city on right. the hill or city, right. paradise. Yes, absolutely. It was all utopian. Uh, the even And as I say, even the Virginia settlements were utopian in some sense. Um, and But then once that, you know, planter, uh, colonial uh, gentry had established itself, the, the merchant planter mm -hmm. colonial gentry had established itself and given up on those more radical ideas, the groups that came subsequently would be outsiders, would be would, would have to remain as, as so unique. So do you think that was in so the... So this started the whole history of communes and intentional settlements, as opposed to just the general utopian aspect of America, early American history. Then comes the specific utopias. Okay, do you think it was uh, partly, or to what extent was it the uh, structure of... Uh, English capitalism, mercantilism, all of these expeditions had to be financed. People had to pay for them, and, mm -hmm. and the ones who paid to control, well, you know, as they, uh, they, they, were, they came here to, to ship stuff back. They, they came here to already, mine the country. Weber already pointed out the uh, relationship between capitalism and Protestantism. And uh, at one time, capitalism was a radical idea. You know, I mean, this is something that even Marx would agree with. Capitalism at one point was the thin edge of the wedge of, of the social movement. You had ideological capitalists who were struggling to bring capitalism into, uh, into being. And uh, these people pretty much generally happened to be sincere Protestants. So, you know, Protestantism and capitalism historically appear together in a sense. So, I mean, you have to, even as anti-capitalists, I think we can realize that at one point, by comparison with feudal remnants and, uh, and uh, uh, mercantile nastiness of uh, various sorts, ideological capitalism looked good. You know, was it looked progressive. It was a reform movement. So how Especially soon did Modern this, day uh, libertarians are still living in that moment of, of when capitalism was in fact radical. So when, right. when, uh, when the first pilgrims landed, say, the pilgrims were, uh, I, they were sort of exceptional, but say when the Puritans came, uh, how uh, everyone who's in a new in a new uh, and wild and, and tough environment like the first uh, a few years of settlement were, were often life and death things. Uh, but how soon did the kind of uh, class structure, to coin a phrase, uh, reassert itself? Was it right at the beginning? I would say, of course, it was immediate. That you didn't. No one got away from class. Uh, certainly not. Uh, were there like were there indentured servants right at the beginning? Of course. I mean. Basically, the people who got left behind at Roanoke were the underclass, mm -hmm. with a few ex a few gentry, gentry exceptions. Well, there was a the general striking and, uh, in uh, Jamestown, like very early. Very on, early on. A Polish glass cutter. Absolutely, James. Right. I mean, uh, certainly there was uh, the uh, people who settled Virginia sent over many more indentured ser uh, types, mm -hmm. indentured servants, uh, and of course they were the people who got into slavery first in a big way too. Um, you know, they were not egalitarian utopianists, don't get me wrong on that point. Uh, <clears throat> the Puritans at least had an egalitarian rhetoric to some extent, which, which made them uh, <coughs> a little bit more, uh, less class structured. But no, class is something that uh, is it's inescapable. Uh, the, the, and the first lower class, call, it happened in Pennsylvania too, it's a little known fact that uh, some of the early Quakers, again, this is pre-1700, uh, completely rejected William Penn's authority, did not agree to send, they broke off communication with him, they did not send him taxes or dues or anything, and they ran uh, uh, Pennsylvania for three or four years just on the basis of the Quaker meeting. It was run by consensus, and if that is an anarchism, I don't know what is. Okay. Uh so all in every case, the lower, almost every case that you can look at, lower class colonists uh, whose sympathies lay with the Indians, with sailors, with blacks, 
then of course you began to get the Irish immigrants who were brought over here as slave labor basically and all of this this kind of uh, what my friend Peter Leinbaugh calls the Atlantic working class you know which was really a bi coastal thing it had to do with England and America yeah I and it, all this became the ferment ferment ground that later was the American Revolution the I, I was uh, amazed to find that the uh, the Bunker Hill incident, uh, the uh, the incident that touched off, uh, or one of the incidents that touched off the American Revolution, was really a labor dispute. Huh. That uh, it, it was a rope walk, it was a factory there, and some British soldiers had come up to moonlight. Uh, they had wanted to work at the place, oh. and there might have actually been a strike at the time, and they might have they were considered as. Uh, potential threats to uh, the black working leg. people there and, and one of them was a black man and they threw snowballs no, no, black, what are they called black leg black leg labor oh yeah black yeah right. they, they scab yeah, labor yeah. Right. i think the, i i think there was a labor dispute maybe at the time and one of them threw a snowball at the <laughs> at these uh, Bri right? at the brits and that started the whole thing and, and in place of another snowball they got a rifle bullet Very and interesting. a few of them ended ended up dead maybe we should have a snowball flag well, i think so yeah uh, um We've got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, we're not then, even then, out of the 17th century. Well, let's, <laughs> well, let's jump ahead to the, uh, uh, I guess the utopian, uh, what we call the utopian colonies, a lot of them were... Uh, Can I give you my potted version? German uh, religious settlements, what right? Hap what happened was the, uh, the Constitution came along and put an end, you know, the American Constitution put an end to all of this kind of social experimentation. The Constitution was a counter-revolution, and it took until the 1820s or 30s for the movement to recover. So we can actually make a jump now, a nice jump from, from the time of the revolution. And we could talk about anarchistic elements in the American Revolution. They were there. Would but you name some names? Oh, I Sa think uh, everybody to the left of Sam Adams, you know. Mm -hmm. Most of them are nameless. You know, it's the mob, right? Mm -hmm. The mob. Right. Tom uh, Payne. But you had people like, uh, you had a lot of people who immediately after the American Revolution ended up in in actions like Shays Rebellion mm -hmm. and the Whiskey Rebellion and the White Indian Movement in uh, Vermont and, and New Hampshire was, mm -hmm. uh, I happen to remember the name of that guy was Barlow, who said uh, that he would destroy all documents uh, and that um, white people had the same right to freedom as our native brothers. He used rhetoric like this, you know. In 17, the 1790s already, uh, it, there were plenty of people around who saw the feder Federalist movement and the Constitution as a counter-revolution. So there's a huge secret history of America that none of oh, us have been taught. I mean, it's just endless. Okay, so it. let's sort of uh, bring us up at least to, uh, so a lot of the early... So we could jump to the middle of the 19th century yeah. when things got underway again. The, the, and, uh, uh, once the it, utopian colonies. Right. Once again, interestingly enough, it was kicked off by religious revivals. Uh, mm -hmm. Protestant extremism, perfectionism, the whole thing. Uh, transcendentalism? And, uh, transcendentalism, absolutely. Brook Farm, key, a key spot. You know, we could talk about all the influences that went into Brook Farm from, from uh, 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 the, you know, the typical American nature mysticism that comes from the Native American side of things to, uh, you know, European uh, philosophy, Oriental philosophy, uh, mysticism of various sorts extreme uh, Protestant radicalism, you know, sort of post-Unitarian Protestant radicalism, and Charles Fourier, you know, uh, utopian socialism, all of this mixed up together in the mid-19th century to produce the radical reform movement and certain beautiful, beautiful communal experiences like Brook okay, Farm. Okay, let's just bring Aren't this up. Are elements of Brook Farm still... Uh in existence where you can visit well there's a museum, museum. yeah there's yeah. one well, but if you want to see the no they oh, yeah, sure in, uh, yeah. well there's uh, they inter in interesting it's in yeah. a boston yeah. suburb yeah interestingly they just they toured they found out that they toured down the last remaining uh, brook farm house no. about 15 years ago really because they they uh, didn't realize that that's what it was it oh. had been moved and used yeah. as an arms house yeah. but let's to tie this all together uh, let me ask you one more question we have how did this tie into uh, to the Eastern urban uh, working class? I, I think Fourierism might maybe might yeah, have been the tie-in. Absolutely, Etienne Cabet is another name, C-A-B-E-T. Another clue for you to follow up. I can't go into right now, but 
Uh, there was a French influence, there was Germ German influence through the uh, Bruderhof, you know, Mennonite, uh, uh, Moravian communalism. <clears throat> there, uh, there were a lot of, of course, it was always European influence, it was always pouring into America, right? Yeah. But you don't start to get the, what we think of as, uh, you know, the Eastern European, Russian, Jewish anarchists, that's all early 20th century. And that's a new element that comes in uh, through those suddenly liberalized uh, um, immigration laws that we were talking about before. But wasn't there, were, were, was there any movement like in the early uh, American working class? Uh, oh, yeah, like the sure. Knights of we're Labor leaving out and people and like Benjamin Tucker, Lysander Spooner, yeah. you know, uh, major anarchist thinkers that, that uh, Josiah Warren, very important. Uh, usually called the first anarchist in American history. But well, were course, they in eastern cities? Were they in, yeah, in, in, well, in, ur in yeah. urban or proletarian uh, working class environments? Yes. What about the early labor Did movement? They have books in print that you could go to the library and... Oh, yeah. Let's, did they tie in with the utopian colonies at all? Oh, there's such a vast bibliography, I wouldn't know where to start. All right, let, well, but people can just go to the library. All right, all right let's, yeah, let's, yeah. Recommend, yeah. let's recommend again places of where... Uh, where Okay, St. Mark's Bookstore is a very good place to start. They have an excellent shelf uh, of anarchist books there. It's in the balcony. On the, right, on the balcony. And then there's the Libertarian Book Club that we, I told you before we give our, our monthly lectures. In fact, we just had Thule uh, uh, give a lecture. Which, At 339 Lafayette Street. 339 Lafayette, room 202, uh, zip code 10012. And uh, there are many other... Uh, anarchist organizations uh, in New York and in the general area, we could try to put people in touch with the type of anarchism that they like. The book club wants to be very general, embracing all, ty all types of anarchism, yeah. Just and, because we're, uh, we're more of an intellectual, you know, discussion outfit than an activist outfit. There's a New York paper, uh, uh, Shadow, which can be bought in many... Uh, yes, also Love and Rage. There's a number of publications. And there are uh, a lot of publications nationwide. There's uh, Fourth Anarchy. Estate out of Detroit. Fifth Estate is Fifth called. Estate, Fifth Estate, sorry. from Detroit and uh, Anarchy from Columbia, Missouri. Those are the two best that I know of. And there's the... Uh, IWW Industrial Worker, which if you might find somewhere, which is becoming a little uh, a lot more anarchist. There's a good uh, good bunch of them at the Living Theater. Good bunch of IWW people. Okay, at the so uh, what's your, uh, say hi to your neighborhood uh, anarchist. <laughs> well, we hope to see uh, we hope to see wh whoever you know uh, get in touch with us, come to one of our lectures. Yeah, and we'll be back here again with uh, Peter Lamborn Wilson. Uh, uh, world well, I've class enjoyed, scholar. I, I've enjoyed it, and really, two two half hour shows is not enough to. No, work. no, we'll, we'll this is going to be continued. It'll be continued. Okay, very good. Nothing is true. Nothing is everything true. Is true. Everything, everything is permitted. Everything is permitted. Everything is permitted. Everything is permitted. Everything is permitted.